So, who's first? I think I have to say, I have to admit, what we provided for today was uh, all the pictures of your web page. Right. If you mind, if you don't mind. And what we wanted to talk is uh, to talk about your projects. Okay. But now we get. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much that you shared so many of your interests yeah. with us. And what we want to see now, um, and thank you for the invitation for this discussion and all of the ideas of landscape architecture, uh, is how the ideas and concepts of our students is, are matching with your ideas and concepts of landscape architecture. And I found one student for each of these pictures, and maybe we can stick to that from the beginning. Okay. Um, so I don't know who was responsible for this picture. Yeah, please stand up, Miriam. <laughs> Let's start with your question and then maybe we get another one. Um, I have the question, um, what is for you more important in your project, project Red Fresh Kill? And is it the intention for the city so they are able to use renewable energies or is it the use for the people as a recreation area? Yeah, uh, it, I mean, there's an article in the newspaper about Fresh Hills that um, it, it, it's a landfill, which means that for years it was dirty and smelly. And there were trucks, trash trucks, and trash barges every day. So the people that live around that site hate it. So when you try and tell them that we're going to make a new park, they don't believe and they don't think it's possible so um, they, they, there's this very negative impression one of the things that changed that was when we had uh, Hurricane Sandy the big storm uh, and uh, the, because the site is so big it actually absorbed a lot of impact from the storm it, 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 it worked as a kind of sponge. It absorbed a lot of tidal water into its various systems and allowed that, allowed that water to stay there. And then people's mentality began to change. They, they began to see it as, a, as an asset. And there was an interesting article written that, that said, if this site had not been a landfill, we, we, we now would not have this open space. It, it would now be a shopping mall. It, it would have been built, it would have been developed. So the fact that it was a landfill actually allowed for these four square miles of, of open space to remain open space. So that began to change people's perception too. And so now there's a, there's a lot more positive attitude uh, because it's big, it's green, it has this uh, resiliency aspect in terms of uh, climate change um, and the memory of it being about waste and trash and smell is, is going away. Now, what kind of park is it becoming though? And I think this is kind of interesting too because it's becoming much more of a wild park. Um, it's, not, it's, not a, um, it's not like Central Park, where you have a band shell and strolling paths and benches to sit on and lawns to fly kites. It, it's a much wilder landscape and people are using it for um, long runs, to go for an eight mile run or to uh, go for a hike to literally with their backpacks and use it for hiking because it's so big. And I think this is very interesting because in the context of New York, we don't really have, um, we don't really have a space like that. All our parks are manicured parks. This is kind of a wild park. Um, so I think that's interesting. And third, lastly, it's still evolving. I mean, it's not nowhere near finished. Um, the soil areas are still relatively small. Um, there was a native seed farm set up to grow seed 
that would allow for reseeding. The goats are still active, eating all the weeds. Uh, you know, it's still very much uh, an, an early stage um, park in terms of its evolution. Now, you asked about sustainability as if there are aspects of um, energy. And there are a little bit, because the landfills are producing warmth. That as, the, as the trash decomposes, it produces warmth. And that warmth is being captured and stored as, a, as an energy source. Um, there are a couple of windmills that are beginning to generate electricity. There's a number of features where we have solar panels that are beginning to produce electricity, etc. So you, you have to do fresh things. A little bit of an amalgam of partly a park, partly an agricultural kind of approach towards trying to remediate very, very damaged lands and partly a sustainability and ecological story. Next. <laughs> Sorry, I just any question in between. Um, how do you, because I think it's very, it's very interesting the process um, and to approach um, projects not with a fixed plan in mind, but also to interact with the people, but I think it could be, or it's probably very difficult to communicate these ideas sure. sometimes because people just expect a, a plan. Because landscape architect, I expect, I expect a plan, and I want this like finished idea. So how do you do that? Do you do workshops with the people, or how do you get? No, we, we, we have. We, you, you end up with a plan. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean the the. Um, I guess, I guess some of the things I showed are more expert techniques for our discipline. So it, it, it's like when you go to the doctor, when you go to a brain doctor or something. Uh, that doctor will have a lot more expertise than he's letting you know. He's just going to tell you in very, very simple terms what, what the issues are with your brain or whatever. right? But in his discipline, there's an extraordinary amount of technique that we don't know anything about. And it's the same here. I'm just trying to show you some techniques as fellow professionals who are engaged with spatial and ecological and urban planning and design. But when you take, when, when, you've, when, you've, when you've conjured up your project, of course, in relationship to how you communicate that to people, it's typically a plan, a very simple plan, and some views, and a relatively simple explanation of, of, of what it is. Um, there's no point making it more complicated, because they, they won't follow. They can barely follow a plan, by the way. I mean, you show most people a plan, and they have no idea so, um, and there's a certain art, I would argue, to how you um, begin to explain your project too, in, in very layman-like terms. Because people are always very suspicious of a project. They think, they think there are ulterior motives behind the project. So they're very suspicious. Uh, they think that you're up to something, they think that your client is up to something. Um, if it's a government project, a public project, they think that the government is up to something. So it's never friendly. So the first thing you have to do is make them like you. <laughs> and you, you, you have to do that by kind of showing them some slides of their locale so that you show that you respect and you understand their sense of place. Uh, and then you begin to introduce the plan as, as somehow a very rational set of moves that you know they will like. And you build their confidence that way. 
So you're absolutely right. If, if I started talking about a Robert Rauschenberg flatbed, or a Richard Long walk, or a Peter Eisenman archaeological layered system, I, I, they, I'd be killed. They would kill me. <laughs> so, but that doesn't mean just because we need to find uh, very simple ways of explaining our work, that does not mean that our own methods should be simplistic. Because simplistic methods will produce simplistic work. If you, you know, I guess what our aim is, is to produce lasting work that can stand the test of time because it's well thought through. And in order to do that, you, you need a deeper, um, a deeper set of intellectual and procedural ways of thinking and working. Okay, next question. Yeah, please. Yes, I have also a question about the question. Um, what was your biggest challenge during that project? Was it the pollution because of just the formal method or was it pure science of it? Well, the, uh, firstly, it's very big. Secondly, it's technically very challenging because there are no soils and it's filled with weeds. By weeds, I mean very invasive species. So if you did a species count, you'd count maybe 20 species. And that's in four square miles. So there's no soil, and it's, it's taken up by invasives. So, um, and, but thirdly, and this is the most complex thing, is just the political regulatory framework around the site. Because, um, <coughs> Uh, part of it belongs to the state, part of it belongs to the city, part of it is being taken over by the parks department, but the Department of Sanitation, which are a bunch of engineers, have the obligation to manage and maintain the site. So there are a lot of kind of political bureaucratic entities that make it almost impossible to do anything. Because any idea you have, somebody will say you can't do that. So you're, you're, you're continually in this challenging situation of trying to get people to buy into even the most basic ideas. For, for example, uh, the site is still considered um, unhealthy for public for public access, so a lot of parts are inaccessible. But we believe that you should be able to open it periodically, say for a weekend, and allow people in just to see it. Because when people see it, they're blown away. That they they're like, wow, we had no idea. It's really hard to explain or even to show in images. But when when people can access it, it's, it's profoundly different. So we tried to get them to think about these things, we call them sneak peeks, that you would have every Saturday. And every Saturday anybody could come and have a sneak peek and they could walk around. And that took probably a year of argument and discussion and process to allow that to happen. So, you know, imagine trying to talk about a tractor over acres of land creating a soil farm. Uh, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do. To get the goats in was a challenging thing to do. So I, the technical challenges can be overcome, but the regulatory, the political, the bureaucratic challenges are super complicated and frustrating. And that's why I said you have you some of the things I was pointing at to do with like how you organize something. If you, you have to be creative and agile because sometimes it's not space or design that you're trying to organize, it's bureaucrats. 
So, you know, you're, you, you're, the, you're the movie director, you're the choreographer, and you need to know how to, get, how to get what you want at the end of the day. And some of it has to do with just how you organize policies, or how you organize uh, a group of people. If you, a bit, you have to view it a bit like a game, but a game that you can orchestrate. Maybe another short question for you as yeah. well. How's the organization scheme in your office compared to Microsoft? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like the Apple one because, <laughs> because well, firstly, I, 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 I want to have access to everybody in the office. So I, I don't want to have the June, you know, the younger people who have just graduated from school. Um, you know, if they've got good ideas, I, I, I want to see that. I want to hear about those ideas. So it's very important to me that I'm accessible. You know, I kind of sit in the office, so I, I, I'm accessible. And uh, I can go to anyone's desk and I can, I can see what's going on. It's difficult when things get bigger. I mean, we're getting bigger and bigger, and we have more and more problems and we have more and more challenges. But um, I, I think that in a project-based business, to be to be central, to be available, to be open to everybody is really important. Yes. When you're planning somewhere else, for example in China, can you go there and get an understanding of the place or like how is it if you plan uh, Well, yeah, you, 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 you uh, partly what I was saying in that question was if you don't know the place, you will be, pe people will just throw you out. Uh, that there, again, there's so much skepticism and suspicion. So if I'm coming in from New York with an English accent <laughs> to anywhere, right, I'm already suspect. <laughs> and so uh, we have to do our research and know what we're getting into and know something about the local ecology, the local culture, try to know a few people so we can make it look like we like we know everything and um, and and be really sensitive to that sense of place people people everywhere are very proud of where they live and um, they believe that um, there's a set of qualities about their place that's very very special and so again, when we come in, New York, English accent, elite design firm, we have a lot of work to do just to build trust because people are very careful about that place. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. You have to go into these places, do a lot of research, walk around, get a sense of how it feels, and probably before you even talk about any ideas, just talk to people about, about, about what's important to them. You know, just ask the very first discussion, you might simply ask people, what, what do they like about where they live? And what do they dislike about where they live? And try to get them to feel comfortable talking to you about that, but that's also how you learn, too, about what's important and also what they're afraid of. And then you can begin to go from there. Okay. I have a question. You started your lecture with Alan um, Barnes at Erkinson. And I would like to know if you think that all the different professionals that you mentioned before, the third habitat guy, the architect and everything, um, if you would want them rather to work together, or if you see 
the role of a specialist in landscape urbanism as one person who combines um, a bit of every subject in one person. Yeah. I, I liken it to a movie director. So you're going to have on your, on your team, you're going to have a cinematographer who's really good with the camera. And as a director, you know a little bit about cameras, but, but you would never be the cinematographer. And you're going to have a sound person who's an expert with sound. And as a director, you know a little bit about sound, but you, 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 you don't know enough to do it yourself. And you're going to have the actors and the actresses and the screenplay and the way the screenplay is written. You're going to have a film editor. Uh, you're going to have a film producer. You know, there's a lot that goes into making a film with a lot of specialists. And the director, in a sense, is the person that knows a little bit about all of that, is a very good listener, because you're listening to the inputs that they're giving you and the ideas that they're giving you. But ultimately, you're the person pulling it all together to create the whole, to, to, to create the vision. And I think of it like that, that um, if we're doing a multidisciplinary project and we have, we have the traffic guy and the architect and the planner and the real estate guy and the economist and the planner and the traffic guy and the engineer and uh, community representatives around the table, they're all going to speak. When they're speaking, Everybody else will be rolling their eyes. You know, they're not interested. But you're sitting at the head of the table, you're listening because you're trying to get the inputs and the intelligence, the intelligence that they're giving you. And ultimately, you're choreographing, you're directing, and you're pulling the whole thing together. You're not the lone genius, it's a team. It's a collaboration, um, but I think these skills with listening, with um, being receptive to what everybody's saying, even if you think it's stupid, be receptive, take it on board, think about how all of the intelligence that you're receiving can help to shape a project. And, you know, make everybody feel that we're part of a team. But it's a, rare, it's a rare skill, because most people, most professionals, uh, have their, uh, you know, they have their way of looking at things. And they're, they're not interested in what others have to say. And they, they can be dismissive. They can just say, oh, that's not important. And that's not what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to get at is a much more inclusive, participatory way of listening and receiving, but also at the same time <coughs> shaping. It's your responsibility to bring the whole thing together. Does that, does that help? Yeah, I'm just wondering if that's really the way it works in reality, if landscape architects are accepted in that role. At the head of the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just assume that role because the, there's probably no one else around the table assuming that. <laughs> so, if, if you know, again, I, I think a lot of landscape architects get themselves into trouble because they just start defending landscape. So you're in a multidisciplinary project, and let's say there's a transportation component and a, a built development component, and there's an open space component. All the landscape architect does typically is just keep defending and talking about their open space components, and they're not really interested in or paying attention to the transportation component and the development component, say. But I think if, if you can pay attention to those components and you can, you, can, you can play a more comprehensive role in terms of seeing it holistically, 
you'll probably be the only one around the table thinking like that. Because everybody else is like it. So you can begin to assume a leadership role. It's not easy. I mean, you, you have to earn the credibility of people sitting around the table. Because anyone who starts to uh, who starts talking, you're immediately looked at with skepticism, as if, well, who the hell is that person? You know. But you know, when you know what you're talking about, and you do it with some confidence, and you actually bring good ideas that people begin to realise are actually good ideas, then you can begin to become a leader and you can begin to lead the direction that it's going. Just do it. <laughs> but you, you, have to, you have to remove your uh, disciplinary blinkers. These, these have to go away. You have to see everything. Yes? Yeah, so my question is about the symbolic. So most of Project 4, so the Navy uh, Central Green Park. So in this, this side, it was wind lines and meadows and a herb and bird habitat. And now it's like an iconic circular park. So I mean, this reference is like uh, from the uh, local vegeta veg vegetables. I like the design for the, like, uh, from the, the vegetables and uh, the abstract shapes to the so, so, I mean, so like a circle, so circular. So my question is, um, do you think if the design uses use some symbols, is it good? Because if you look at the blind, it's more like the design is for the bird, it's not for the human, you know? But, you know, it's, I mean, when the people, they can't see the plant like this, it's more like a, from the bird's perspective. Well, that, that project, um, is a is part of a um, um, a new development, and a lot of the buildings around this are new buildings which are for new technology, new new media companies, kind of like Google or Facebook. So most of the employees in those buildings are younger younger people, and secondly. Uh, there are some other buildings going up that uh, is housing and um, uh, like a restaurant and a cafe and this sort of thing. So they're building, they're building a kind of a neighborhood, but they also have this tech uh, media focus with, with the building. Some of the buildings are eight to ten stories high, so you're looking down, and the initial request for, from the client was that this just be a green space. That it be essentially a nice green park. A lawn, a hill, some flowers, trees, a bench. And we said no, it should be it should be an active, it should be activated. Because you have a lot of people here, especially young people, and especially tech companies now, are trying to, you know, avoid a 40 week, a 40 hour week. They're trying to make the workplace a place of lifestyle as well. So this park was conceived as something that was active and would be inviting a variety of uses. The reason you have a big circle around the outside is that that's essentially a running track. And we called it a social track because we put chaise lounges and benches around the track. So it is a running track, it's also a walking track, but it's also a sunbathing track. You can sit on the, on the sun lounges and face the sun and you'll see people going around the circle. The circle is also exactly one-fifth of a mile. So five times around the circle is one mile. So you can, you can count. So that's where the geometry begins to come from. Not, not from uh, a representational or symbolic idea, but from 
a, a practical, <laughs> practical idea about if, if you're going to go out for a walk and you want it to be a mile, how do you know you've walked a mile? If you want to go for a run or whatever. But also to socialize it and to not just create a typical running track, but to create something that's social and a little bit funny. And then on the inside, the other circles encapsulate different uses. There's a, an amphitheater, there's a wetland that collects all of the stormwater, there's a, a bocce field where you can play bocce, there's an outdoor classroom where you have tables for outdoor uh, meetings, um, there's a picnic area, there's a stand of pines with hammocks, where people can lounge in a hammock in the shade of the pines. So it just becomes um, an organizational diagram to take these different uses and to just organize them. And so it has more of a pragmatic <coughs> direction. It's got nothing to do with symbolism or with what it looks like. It's got more to do with how it works and how it's organized. It's an organizational diagram, not unlike the organizational diagrams I showed you. We're just trying to organize a variety of activities to put them into, into sort of unusual adjacencies, unusual relationships. As my main reference, um, methodological, like uh, programming, uh, living system. And I also did some research about complex system, and I know that complex system have, has some um, characteristics of, of um, self-organizing, unpredictable, and emergency. So there is kind of um, contradictory that uh, I know that a complex system is unpredictable, yet I still need to programming some complex system. And um, I, I always have this doubt about um, my program about this living system. I don't know if you have this kind of doubt or uh, how do you deal with this kind of doubt when you deal with uh, you, you, you mean doubt because of the unpredictability? Yes. So, just accept it. <laughs> yeah. of, of course, it's going to be unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. So just accept that. But, but just as you said, um, we have a very narrow narrow vision uh, from like people from different disciplines have very narrow vision and we as landscape architect also have narrow vision. So that's right and um, uh, look it goes back to this question about a plan. You of course you have to get you have to draw a plan and you need construction documents <coughs> to take something into construction. And it's, it's going to be built, and you're going to have an opening day, and photographers will be there, and that's it, right? But um, with landscapes and with public space, that project will continue to evolve and change. It will be outside of your control. So you have to accept that. I, I, it, it's a fundamental difference between landscape architects and architects. I mean, I think architects do a building, they love for it to be fixed and to be precise and for it to not change. Uh, you know, in some architects' minds, it's a work of art and it needs to absolutely stay perfect. But I think there's an arrogance in that because even buildings have a time-based aspect to them. They're occupied by people. People will put curtains up. The facade from the outside will begin to get a little messy. <laughs> it's not going to be perfect. Uh, Rainwater will begin to stain the facade. You know, the best architects know all of this. That they know that a building will have occupancy and it will weather 
they know it will change, and they often design that into the building. But most architects don't think like that. They think of that building as being fixed and finished and perfect. Um, in landscape, uh, we, we too, we do need a finished product. We do need to have construction documents that are pretty precise and, and you know, fixed. Our paving scheme on the High Line is highly precise. And the system that it's built from is, is very, very precise. But at the same time, uh, as the landscape is outside of our control now, we, we don't. We don't have anything to do with it anymore, and uh, it's taken on dimensions that we never, we never foresaw. Um, it, it's got its own life. So I think I think you have to accept unpredictability as inevitable, and um, also during a design process, you you might come up with a beautiful design, and when you start to show it to people they want you to make little changes to it. And you could either take the position, well, I'm not changing anything, right? I'm going to stay in control. I'm the master author of this work of art. But in the public realm, it's not your work of art. It, it is, the, if, you're, if you're sincere about publicness, then you have to accept that that the public have a say in shaping the space. And so you, you have to yield, and you have to give, and you have to show flexibility. And the design begins to evolve. And then, sure, you go into construction documents, it's precise and it's built, but even after it's built, it begins to change too. So because of that inevitability, I wouldn't worry about it. It's like a child, you have a child, and you can either try to control that child, uh, or you can just love it and keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> and it will, it will all be okay. The child will be fine. You, you can steer, you can guide, you can influence, but you can't control. And the child will go on and have a life, and will there'll be lots of surprises along the way. And I just think that that's a landscape architect's imagination. And that because of our medium, landscape architects are much better at giving and yielding and steering and letting things go than architects are. Architects are very rigid. And maybe it's maybe they have to be because they're working with doors and windows and things that need to be very precise. But I would still argue that even a building has a life. A building might be built for office workers, but five years later it's a residential building, and five years later it's a school. <laughs> you know, the building has different dimensions to it, different a different lifespan. And landscape architects are much better at accepting that. And I think that's one of our strengths. You don't need to bang the table and be, be argumentative. You, you, can be, uh, you can love the fact that things evolve, things change. And that's, that's a great thing. I hate preservation, for example. And there's a big movement in America to preserve a lot of um, public spaces that were designed by famous landscape architects. It's stupid. It's stupid. Those spaces don't work anymore. They're, they're, no one goes into them. They're dark, they're falling apart, they're not working. Somebody wants to preserve them because some landscape architect made them a hundred years ago. It's stupid. Right? I mean, I, I, you pull the high line down in 10 years' time, I don't care. Right? No one, no one, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't care about things. So you, you, you view your projects like your children. You love them, you 
try to shape them in the best way that you can, but they're inevitably going to change. You told us that you don't have any um, corporate identity or a specific um, style. Um, how difficult um, is it for you um, having such uh, highly awarded projects like the Highline, or iconic uh, projects like the Highline uh, in your portfolio, and um, the next client comes and expects, expects a Highline in his project? Um, how difficult is it to deal with that? With that? Well, it's annoying. <laughs> it's annoying. You just have to go with the flow. I mean, um, China. Chinese like to have a heart. <laughs> and you just have to say you can't, you can't have it. it and it, 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 you know, you have to explain to people that what makes the Highline great isn't so much the design of it, but it's context. Um, it's, you know, just because you're in New York City, in amongst these big buildings, um, crossing the streets, with all these views and vistas to landmarks, with the buzz and the noise and the vibrancy of the city, that's partly what makes the highlight great. Right? So to just take the same paving and furnishing and planting and put it somewhere else would be stupid. Because contexts are different and what you're trying to do in any project is, is look at the context. What, what is the context and, and uh, what, what can we do here that will revitalize that context, bring that context to life. And that typically will require a unique invention, a unique response. So when people say, oh, we're going to hire you to do another Highline, we just say, oh, it, it makes no sense. You, you, the Highline is unique to its context, and you just, you, it, we're not going to give you the paving, and the furnishing, the railing, and the planting, the lighting, because it wouldn't make any sense. But you're right. People do call up because they want they want you to do something just like you did somewhere else. Okay, yeah, but you still have some um, projects that um, mm -hmm. that are, they are kind of uh, representative, um, not only um, stick to the unique character uh, characteristics on the site, like um, you you have some projects that uh, I mean. For example, the um, urban metabolism, I, I I placed on that project, and then I found you made uh, many analyses, and I think those, and then you also um, proposed some strategies, and I think those strategies and the, the the methods you can use for later projects, not only like well, um, like Highline, we 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 only we, we only have one Highline in the world, but we can use those strategies, those methods, those um, ideas in sure. another, like, like the toolbox you just mentioned yeah. before, right? Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, you, you, develop, you develop different tools and techniques, you develop different ideas as you, as you grow. As the, as the years tick by and you've done more and more projects and uh, They've been at different scales, from very small to very big, and you've had a whole set of experiences, then of course your tool bag gets bigger. You, you have more to draw upon. Um, and you know, that that's the intelligence that you that you bring. I mean I call it intelligence. You are more intelligent when you when you have that. Um, set of techniques. Yeah. Um, so the Highline is one of your most famous projects and um, your most famous project. And um, many people love it. Um, but is there another project uh, you can say it's your personal hidden masterpiece? Um, <laughs> well, I I love. Um, I, I think the Tongva Palm. Where is it? 
Uh, it's it's those two at the back there. Yeah. Those are those are the best the best images per se. But that's a really beautiful project. Okay. And um, to it, it's very well made. It it, it it's hard with um, a construction sometimes. Mm -hmm to get good finishes and to get good details. Um, but that, that is a beautifully made project. Uh, there are concrete retaining walls and we made the contractor get a chain, a big, a big thick chain and whip the concrete to, to give it a texture. Uh, so there are lots and lots of little details like that 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 uh, make it a joy to walk around. Mm -hmm. And you walk from different places. There's a children's play area, there's a set of horticultural gardens, there's a series of outlooks and pavilions, there's uh, a small amphitheater, there's, there's an event and performance lawn, there's some wind sculpture, there's a couple of water features. I mean, there's a lot in there, and it's actually a very small site. So, that, that's one that I really love. Um, I think uh, Fresh Kills in a different way. I mean, Fresh Kills is a very annoying project. You're just frustrated and annoyed most of the time. <laughs> but when you visit it, it's really beautiful. Now, it's not beautiful because of anything we did. It's. Uh, it's just the way it's evolving as a landscape type that's really, really beautiful. And, uh, you know, if anything, uh, you know, it, it, the experience of that landscape makes you wonder, uh, you know, does design sometimes fuck things up? And, and, and I think it does. I think design sometimes is too much and it, it kills something. So Fresh Kills, what I like about it is it's, it's not designed. It, it's, just, it's just an emergent system. It's just kind of evolving. And it just kind of gets better and better every year because more species are moving in, the textures are more interesting, and the goats are out there. and It's just weird. Um, and that was the approach we took with the High Line, because when we first stepped on the High Line, it was so magical. No, nobody knew that the top was green. Everybody knew the underside as being a very dark industrial structure in, in a fairly tough part of town. There were a lot of drugs and nightclubs and crime. Uh, it's a tough, tough part of town. So, to step onto the top, where nobody could get onto it, so it was inaccessible, nobody could see it. When you could get onto the top and you could see that for a mile, this line of green uh, just cut through the city. It's like, wow, this is fantastic. And then you think, and now there's a, a design competition. You know it's going to be over-designed. And sure enough, Saha Hadid ignores the High Line and does something wonderful, but got nothing to do with the magic of what, you, what, what was found. Um, in fact, everybody went over the top with design. They, they, whereas our approach was, this is fantastic. How do we do as little as possible <laughs> to, um, to, to just amplify its character? And to use the child metaphor, it's a little bit like steering a child. You know, you have a child, they have a personality. You sense a potential. And how do you actualize that potential? How do you amplify personality characteristics so that that, you know, that child's personality 
is just grows into something fantastic. But it it grew out of the original the original chime. I think the same is the approach with the, a project like the Highline. It was such a fantastic found object. The question becomes, how do you design something that allows everything that we're enjoying to be amplified and to be made even more profound, rather than some kind of new design? And the new design might be fantastic, but it has, it has nothing to do with, with, uh, with, the, with the original. So that, that's what I learned from landscapes like Fresh Kills and, and the High Line, is um, you know, places have an innate potential. And how do you catch on to that potential? And then how through design do you allow that to, to come forward in a very magnified way? Yeah. Uh, I have a question concerning the Tango Park. Uh, because um, at the beginning it was a plain uh, parking lot, wasn't it? Yeah. And I would like to know where all the material for the hills came from. Was it difficult to shape and fix um, hills out of a plain space? Yeah, so you're right. It was, it's a flat site and um, it's surrounded on all. On one side has a freeway, <laughs> and the other side, you can just see the road there, is really a six-lane road with buses and cars. It's very, very noisy. So, when you stood in any corner of that flat site, you could hear the noise, and you could see, you could see, you could see across, and you just saw big buses and big cars. So the earthwork was really an attempt to try to enclose the site and to create more of a garden so that uh, the streets are kept out. Um, but they also have another benefit and that is that by lifting you up 20 feet you could now see the ocean. So the ocean is a block away, the beach and the ocean of Santa Monica. And yet, when it was a flat parking lot, you couldn't see anything. You had no sense that the beach and the ocean was there. So the hills play this double role. One, they enclose the interior of the park to create an interior. And secondly, they lift you up, and then you get these great, these great overlooks. And we designed the pavilions in the, in the overlooks to, because, the pavilions have an unusual characteristic to them and when you see people standing in the pavilion looking out now when you're on the road passing by it's an invitation to come into the park because the park now has a, has an unusual face uh, an unusual aspect that's an invitation to come in so there's a number of reasons why, why we had the topography. And then we sculpted that topography, and then we did it in a very sophisticated digital modeling software, which allows you to shape curvilinear three-dimensional form. And then we were able to use that same software to cut multiple sections that then led to construction documents because the geometries are quite complicated. Um, the curvilinear walls, for example, don't only curve in plan, they curve in, they curve in section. It's a very difficult thing to draw, let alone construct. So, um, another slide deck I was going to share with you, but we don't have time, but is, is to show you how a project like Tongva Park is actually developed technically um, through, through pretty advanced computer digital modeling software that allows you to work with complex geometries to build complex forms. Yeah. The back there. I would uh, like to 
to come back to this discussion, um, preserving or transforming or making something new. Because, of course, if you preserve something which is not used or doesn't function, it's clear. But on the other hand, you said every site has a memory and the original quality of a site. Um, and often in history, people demolish things and 50 years later, you regret it. So how do you decide in your projects which things you want to keep or transform or which things you can totally demolish, make new? Do you have some yeah. here? Well, I don't know. I mean, the, the idea of memory, uh, you know, there's a slightly annoying sentimentality, you know, to, to, to that, you know, where you're very precious about, um, about something that might no longer be working, might no longer have any real value, but just because it's been there a hundred years, we should be sentimental about it. So, on the one hand, there's an annoying aspect to sentimentality in the city. On the other hand, um, you know, places are, uh, you know, you think about a city like London, for example, I mean, London is fantastic because of the way in which older aspects of London have been incorporated into newer aspects. You know, you, you, you do get a sense that it's a very rich uh, fabric. It's not all old, it's not all sentimental, there's actually some very new, innovative things. But the way in which the old and the new mix and uh, are made is 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 very enriching, right? And I think that's the that's the aspect. Not not to be sentimental, but to try to enrich the quality of a place because of its memory or because of certain characteristics that it has. Um, Peter Eisenman, in the Peter Eisenman layers I showed you, I mean, he did that in a very intellectual way. It's like maps and tracings and archaeologies uh, become layered to tell the story of a place. That's, a, that's what I would call a very textual approach. It's a narrative, and you actually have to read the, the, an Eisenman garden as a text. Um, I think what, it, what interests me more is how you do it viscerally uh, through experience rather than intellection. So with an, with an Eisenman work that was all about memory and, and, and time, but it's a text. You, ha you have to read it. Um, for me, I'd rather, I, I would rather f find it in a more visceral way. I would argue that the High Line, again, is, is a good example of a memory that is the High Line itself, that was perceived by many to be very negatively. I mean, the original story of the High Line is people wanted it pulled down. They saw it as derelict and uh, abandoned and dangerous. They saw no part, no point in this being developed as a public space at all. So, there was no sentimentality, you could say, right? But on the other hand, it, it was an unusual artifact in the context of the city. It's just very unusual to have this big mile and a half long of steel uh, running through the city. And um, so, I think we were able to take a historical artifact that had a certain memory and to turn it into something new while at the same time retaining the authentic, the authentic original. For, a, for example, a simple thing like the railings, the pipe, the pipe railings on the side, the original railings built from pipe 
and there's some other railings there. Those were all covered in a lead paint and they were not at the right height for the local regulations, for code. So there's a big push to remove them. Just let's take them off and let's build new railings. And we said, no way. I mean, these are fantastic, this, these are fantastic things. They're, they're beautiful and, and they're authentic. So we had to abate the paint, we had to remove the paint and do it in an in a environmentally safe way. And then we had to build a new railing on, on the inside that, that brought the railing up to code, to meet code. And the railing that we built on the inside is designed to be nearly invisible. It's, a, it's built from a, a very fine mesh and it has a very simple aluminum top. And the idea of that was to make that inside railing practically invisible so that the original railing is what you see. But there was a big effort at the beginning to, to just remove it because they saw it as being co coated in lead paint and um, not meeting coat. So I think that's a very good example of taking something old that doesn't work anymore, that people don't see any value in, and finding a way to retrofit it in a way that brings it back to life. Okay, we should slowly but surely try to wrap up this round, but maybe two more questions okay. if you allow. One here, one there. Question. Yeah, go ahead. I've got another question about the town of Park. Um, it was named after the indigenous town of people. Um, how did the indigenous people inspire for the functional concept of the Right. So, you don't have a picture of the pavilions. Have you seen the pavilions? That they look like organic forms. Um, we design those. Purely formal design. We thought they were cool. And we were showing off with our new modeling software. And we had to go to the Architecture Commission to get their approval. And the architects didn't like them because we weren't architects. <laughs> and um, they started fussing with them about the geometry and how, the, how they would actually fix the base. And, and we were having trouble. And um, it didn't look like we were going to get approval. And then the Tongva tribe came along, and uh, we had a separate meeting with them, and we showed them these, and they loved them. And they loved them because they uh, had a tradition of basket weaving, weaving baskets. And they had a tradition of weaving baskets that would collect the wind. They called them the wind baskets. And they kind of looked like this. I mean, they were just baskets. But they had a, um, they, these resonated with them as being the wind baskets. And so we went back to the Architectural Commission and we said, these are Tongva inspired wind baskets. <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> so I think that's a really interesting story. We, we, didn't, we didn't design these to represent Tongva wind baskets. In fact, when you look at an image of a wind basket, they look nothing like these. They're, they're just a little basket. But, um, but it's an interesting uh, method to go back to the slide that showed all these different interest groups that you have to deal with. The, the only way to deal with them is to, put, is to put one against the other to get what you want. So, um, you know, in Tongva Park, for example, we had a public meeting on the site and in the very early stages of design. 
And I was dressed in white for some reason. It was a hot day. I had white pants and a white shirt. And uh, a bunch of people started lining up to talk to me. And uh, they, they were all sick in one way or another. And I felt like Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was in white and they were lining up. And one of them had an had a oxygen tank and said, don't let there be any tobacco smoke in this park. It'll kill you. I said, absolutely right. She went away. And then another guy came and he, he had melanoma on his skin. He said, we need shade. We need trees everywhere. We need shade. I said, absolutely right. He went away. And then another person came and they had another skin disease and they said, um, don't make it too shady and dark because, you know, we need sunlight for vitamin D. I said, Ab absolutely right. They disagreed. And another person came in a wheelchair and said, you know, you've got to make sure that we can, um, that in wheelchairs, we can access these hilltops and get our chairs up to the hilltop. He said, absolutely right. And what happens is you get so much ammunition that when you go to present the project to a committee that wants to start picking at it, you can say, well, hold on. The people said that they wanted more trees for shade. And they go, oh, OK. Mm -hmm. And um, these ramps have to be wheelchair, um, have to be able to accommodate wheelchairs. That's why we need the ramp. And people want to do this, and people want to do that. And by the time you've by the time you've heard everybody, it's annoying. You've got to hear everything. But by the time you've heard everything, you've got every bullet in your ammunition to, to get whatever you want in the design because you can, turn it, you can turn it around. And it's the same with the Tongva thing and the Architectural Commission. The Tongva became very useful. And as a consequence of that, it wasn't called Tonga Park at first, it was called Santa Monica Central Green or something. And after I told the story of the wind baskets in a public meeting, the city council decided to call it Tonga Park to honor the Tonga tribe. So it's a really kind of interesting story. But it's one of those unpredictable journeys. We, we never knew, we never knew any of that. It, it, it just has to unfold in a very unpredictable way and you, you take every opportunity you can to steer it in the direction you want. And you don't always get what you want, but you, you mostly get. And the part that you don't get, you just have to accept as an inevitability. It's never going to be perfect. Do it. Secondly, because they're public, projects, typically the client wants it to be a complex team because they think that's more equitable. Uh, and thirdly, in the specific case of the High Line, Field Operations was a very small firm at the time. We, we would never have gotten the job without the team. Uh, Dill's video would, was very small at the time too. They would never have gotten a job on their own. Uh, P. Tudolf was an unknown at the time. So by putting together a group of young unknowns, we were able to make a more formidable, a more compelling, more credible team. Uh, in the case of Seattle, uh, where, where we lead, but again, there's, there's a, there, there are three big architecture firms and engineering firms and everybody. And so all of these projects are complex. And so therefore, you, you, A, you have a lot of headaches because there's a lot of people involved, a lot of opinions, a lot of ideas. And not only do you have to deal with the client, you've got now got to deal with the team. And uh, so that's one problem. Uh, and the second is, is just, it's just how you parse the work. So uh, in the case of the High Line, 
Uh, field operations was the lead. We were the contract holder. We were in charge. Dilliscophidio, I invited them originally because uh, there's a, the, are a number of elevators and stairs and uh, vaults and architectural components. And I think that they have a very theatrical sense of architecture, and I thought that's the kind of architect that, that we need. Uh, with P2 Dolph, I knew we needed a kind of a wild garden, and I knew that he had the expertise to do that. The engineers that we selected were engineers that I knew were specialized in this kind of structure. So we put together a team, in other words, with an architect that we thought was very specific to what was needed here, a horticulturalist with expertise very specific to what was needed here, an engineer that was very specific to what was needed here, etc. It, was, it wasn't just any old architect, it wasn't just any old horticulturalist, it was specific to this project. And that's what made it work. Because then we could sit down uh, and we could get to work. And um, basically the engineer worked with retrofitting the structure. Dillis Video worked primarily on the elevators and the stairs, the access points and the vaults. And field operations worked on the top side. The top side is the paving, the railings, the plantings, etc. And in collaboration with Pete and the planting beds. So it worked because as a collaboration, each specialist knew their, knew their part. Where collaborations don't work is, is when you, um, I don't know, you sit, let's say in the case of the High Line, let's say we picked a different architect who really wasn't the right architect for the High Line, who, who wanted to build a building on top of the High Line. So, yeah, that, that would have been a disaster <laughs> because you would, you, you would be continually uh, arguing about that and it would be a misfit. Uh, or let's say we chose an architect who wanted to do everything and wanted to take over our role. Fortunately, we were the lead and we held the contract so we could always uh, be the final decision maker. But if we, if we didn't, if we were not the lead, we, we would have had a, a challenge uh, if, if there was an architect involved who wanted to take the whole thing over. So I think putting teams together is something you have to do on any project. Finding the right specialist for the right project is, is, is an art unto itself. And then how you actually collaborate um, is also an art. And it works best when everybody uh, has their specialty and isn't trying to do <coughs> things. Um, and that, that's, that's essentially how, how it worked.
Our universities uh, are so much about you know efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So sitting together like this is really not happening. Uh, often, so that's really great. Thanks again for your presentation. And of course, I expect you all to be there tonight to listen to your talk. That's what we're going to let you go right now and relax a little bit and see your presentation tonight. It's going to be different because you know it's going to be up front and uh, presenting to a large audience. Well, it's more it's more rapid. It's fire. more rapid it's fire, fire, exactly. <laughs> so once again, it was great to have you here. And right. my question, yeah, I just want to add one thing sure. that we talked about this last night is that I hope to have instilled in you or inspired you a little bit to raise the bar to, to just be a lot more ambitious about what it is you do to aspire to greatness to, to be fucking ed right? I mean, I unfortunately you inspired me to rise the bar okay. <laughs> And that's scary them a little bit more. This is the this is the the next generation, Absolutely. and so to um, you know it will take time. It's it's not going to come easy, and the confidence that it takes to be able to operate at a high level, it takes it takes a certain degree of of confidence. Um, I guess when you're younger, that that's going to take a form of arrogance, in a sense, because you. You just have to fucking go for it, and fingers crossed. And um, but I, I think our profession generally lacks ambition. And uh, in a sense, our profession has never been better positioned than it is now. There, there are so many urgent environmental issues, the climate issues. Um, sustainability issues, livability issues, urban issues in terms of how cities can function better, um, social equity issues, how to be more socially just, how to create spaces that are inclusive and participatory and social, how to up uplift people's lives. I mean, these are big issues that are very, very topical today and there's no profession like less architecture better position to 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 work at that. But there's just a general lack of ambition. People work at a fairly middle level. And so if anything, in our two hour chat this morning, you know, I, I would just urge you all to work that little bit harder to Look for your role models to be to get your source of inspiration and to have a high degree of ambition to, to really go for it to be number one, not number two, and certainly not number a thousand. <laughs> I hope we'll get a chance to invite you back someday. <laughs> Maybe spend a, you know, spend, a, spend a long weekend workshop and really get to yeah. it. So that would have been my that would have been my last question. Would you, would you come back again if you'd like? <laughs> I would like to come back in twenty years' time when one of you is sitting here showing me something that blows my mind. That's okay, that's what that's, the that's, uh, that's what the bet is. That's a right? good aim. Great. Thank you very much, and uh, see you tonight. And uh, have a good time. Thank you.